I hope you're having um, a great national campaign for grade level reading week. And this program is part of that today. I'm Lisa Finaldi, the community engagement leader here at the North Carolina Early Childhood Foundation. And today we're going to hear from our partners in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, they are part of the Durham Campaign for Grade Level Reading and the Partnership for Children and Book Harvest um, are the co organizers of the campaign with um, many partners in the organization. And they've been uh, working together since 2017. Today, we are going to focus on how these literacy partners have really prioritized parents, um, guardians and caregivers as decision makers, community leaders, um, and advocates for their families. Um, and so we'll be hearing from a number of um, different folks who are managing uh, different programs within the system. Um, when I say system, they'll tell you a little bit about what that means in a moment. So before we get started, I just wanted to remind you to please sign in via the chat. We'd like to see your name, your organization, and your pronouns as well. And you can put questions in the chat and we'll be monitoring it throughout. And we may take some uh, throughout the program, but we also may just hold them till the end. And so this will operate as a panel discussion. And I would like to um, start the program. So Mary, you can move to the next slide to show you who will be our, um, our panelists today. And each one of them will introduce themselves as we get started. So with the next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to Katie Starr. Hi all, my name is Katie Starr, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm Program Coordinator of Community Initiatives at Durham's Partnership for Children, so one of the backbone agencies of the campaign. So Katie, you could um, get rolling and remind Samara about when to move the slides for you. Okay, sounds great. Um, so as Mary was saying a little bit background of Durham's campaign for grade level reading. We are a partnership of organizations, parents, community leaders um, across Durham. Um, two main goals are really promoting parent engagement that best supports children's literacy development um, and just amplifying and collaborating on early literacy initiatives that strengthen um, this community impact. So today, I'll be speaking on a collaborative that we spearheaded um, called Capture Moments in Time. Um, and the goal of this program was to promote early literacy activities um, and family engagement by creating bookmaking kits um, and also to have families define for themselves what early literacy means. And so um, to get started, we just have a little short video um, on the next slide that talks about a parent who was really involved with this initiative. So Winston received this book from Book Harvest. Um, we always go to their events. <laughs> and so they had a book party um, this past week. And, and this book is called Neighborhood Animals. So Winston's gonna read this book. You ready? Oh, yeah. Mouse? Oh, this is awesome. Ladybug? Ladybug. They like to be on, what is this? A leaf. Yes, you want to be in my hand. They like to be on your hands too. Yes, because you like, like to catch ladybugs outside. Yeah, he had to catch it with the net. If you play in the, in the net, we catch it. You'll catch it with the net. <laughs> it went it out. And what, ah! is this, and what is this word? Uh, uh, oh, gee. <laughs> oh, and does the frog have big eyes? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. And what do they do with their tongues? <laughs> <laughs> That's what they do. That's they awesome. do that. They catch insects with their sticky tongues. Oh, that was awesome. Winston, that was amazing. Oh, and it sounds like you know a lot about animals, too. 
Yes. So he's going to use the um, materials from Captures in Time. He's going to make his, what are you going to make, Winston? A triceratops. He's going to make a triceratops. You going to draw it? Yes, and my with the markers. With the markers, yes. Let's use it with the paper. And we'll use the paper. And what about this? Are you going to use this to take pictures? Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm going to take a picture of this one. So you'll take pictures of all of your triceratops. And you're going to talk about what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. Dino builder. A dino builder. I just built it. Yes. So we'll, so we'll build his book based off of his love for dinosaurs. Thank you for having us and being a part of the parent involvement group has really been um, very enriching for Winston. As you can see, he's always excited to get the books. He's an early reader, so he's trying to learn how to read. So um, basic phonics. Um, and he's actually trying to open up this camera right now because he's so excited. Ready to take pictures of all his dinosaurs that he has. Um, so yes, yeah, this, this has been a great experience for us. Um, you know, I, I, I truly believe in the mission of campaign for great level reading. Um, it starts with, you know, you as a parent. And um, for me, I think the earlier, better, you know, experiences when Winston, um, before he was born, I was reading books to him. Um, he had a period where he had to be in the NICU. Uh, and I constantly read books to him. And it's so interesting that the one book that he still loves to this day is the pout pout fish and so just just opening up his mind to the different worlds that um come with reading books has just been a part of our daily lives since he was born so i just think it's, it's strongly important that parents kind of um you know tap into that a little bit you know the the five minutes of reading um impromptu reading um they may not know all the words on the page, but start to look at the pictures um, so they can at least conceptualize what the author is trying to talk about. Um, I can really go on and on, but what this parent involvement um, piece has, again, been very meaningful to us um, because I'm a strong advocate for it, you know, for reading and um, children's minds are like sponges. <laughs> But you know, it's uh, the, you know, the earlier you expose them to, um, they gain interest, and you know, you find out what they're interested in, and for and it's um, dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. for years now, <laughs> oh, <my laughs> at least two God. strong years uh, that I can remember. So, um, just being able to be with other parents and talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, ways to kind of help um, help your child in the home environment it's just again been very helpful. I want to continue with he's uh, pre K ready, he's pre K bound, um, and so just looking through enhancing more of his um, phoneme awareness and love for books, um, writing books. Um, yeah, very, very inspired um, by him to to do that um so it's just been an overall great experience um i think that katie was having as good of a time as mary and winston <laughs> so um katie why don't you tell us a little bit more about the capture um capturing moments in time and also i know you wanted to tell us a little bit more about the families that you've worked with yeah, absolutely. So the goal of this initiative was to promote early literacy by creating and distributing these bookmaking kits. Um, so these kits contained bookmaking art materials, the actual books and cameras for families to create, um, create their own stories. And so here are some amazing quotes from um, one of the parents that we worked with on this initiative. 
And really the goal of this project was just for families to create, um, be the ones telling their own stories and the driving force of narrative around early literacy. Um, so I can dive more into um, the details of all that, but that's a little bit of an overview for right now. That's great. Thanks, Katie. Um, next we, uh, Samara, if you can move to the next slide, uh, we're gonna move into Caitlin uh, Bergman from Book Harvest. Thanks, Lisa. And thank you for sharing that video, Katie. I always love seeing Mary. She's a longtime friend of Book Harvest. Uh, so it's always nice to see her. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about um, a new initiative that we started at Book Harvest um, during the pandemic called Book Boxes. Um, but just a little bit of background. Um, Book Harvest is a children's literacy nonprofit based here in Durham, North Carolina, and I am the book bank manager here. Um, and we believe in meeting families where they are um, and that learning happens everywhere. Um, and so during the pandemic, things uh, shifted uh, with our work and we realized that families were able to safely spend a lot of time outdoors, um, which led us into this, uh, this concept of outdoor book provision. Um, so our book boxes really capture that model of meeting families where they are and that learning can happen everywhere. Um, so these outdoor structures um, are, are built by a wonderful volunteer of ours and then they're installed with a whole variety of different um, partners in the community. Um, and the goal behind it is just that families can have that safe access to children's books wherever they go. Um, we maintain them, we restock them um, regularly with children's books, and then families have access to those and can take as many as they want. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit more today about how that idea came to be and how we really engaged with parents to make that possible um, here in Durham. And so, um, Samira, if you want to go to the next slide, I've got a few photos that um, show what the book boxes look like. Um, we worked with parents to think about um, things as simple as like, well, what are we going to call these? Uh, what is kid friendly? Um, what would attract families? Um, we wanted them to be really um, appealing for families in our community. I love the colors, the double doors. Um, you can see that the kids really are drawn to it. Um, and so from that very initial stage of figuring out what we're going to call them, what they're going to look like and even where they're gonna go. Um, we worked with parents all along the way um, to, to make this idea a reality here in our community. I'm just curious about how did you get the book, the book boxes made? Yes, so we have a wonderful volunteer. His name is Miguel um, and he works with us to do a lot of um, wood and work woodworking building bookshelves for us um he actually we have another program called book babies he built all of our bookshelves for our book babies um so when it was time to start thinking about how to get these made he was the first person we reached out to um and he he's incredible i kind of we put together an idea of what we wanted sent him examples and then he was able to run with it and create a blueprint that worked for us um, tweaked it along the way to make sure that it fit our needs um, based on that feedback we were receiving from uh, families using the book boxes. So we've adjusted the size a little bit, um, got creative with the colors. Um, so he has been instrumental in helping uh, make this possible. That's great. Thank you, Caitlin. We're going to turn it over to Carlene. Yes, thank you. Good, af good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carlene Fife Phillips. I work with the Durham County Library in the unit called Family Literacy and Community Services. I'm going to talk today about an, an initiative I call Serving Up Books and Meals, or even the other way, if you like serving up meals and books. That's what I'm gonna talk about. And this came about because of the opportunity provided by COVID-19. With the onset of COVID-19, a lot of our families that we serve had new challenges, new obstacles, new barriers. With that, I started to think about how we could continue serving these families. Because as you know, COVID-19 caused a lot of us to close our doors to our customers. 
all of our libraries were closed. And as the unit that takes <laughs> services to the community, I was really concerned about our families. We go out to, to the vulnerable, we go out to the under-resourced and the underserved. And again, those families were, were facing new challenges with the onset of COVID. As I thought about how I could reach these families in the context of COVID, I kept thinking and thinking and suddenly the opportunity presented itself. I learned about a program that was happening with Deep Durham Public Schools Foundation. Durham Public Schools Foundation, the program was called FEAST. That program was taking meals, nutritious meals to families where they were. And I thought, we could do that. We could help with that. They needed drivers. In my unit, we have three vehicles that we use. You see one on the screen here. That is our bookmobile destination literacy. Of course, normally we take books, but I, I realized that we could use our vehicles to help to deliver these meals. We also have two other vehicles that we use. I approached library leadership about the possibility of using our vehicles to help with this. I was so delighted when I got the go ahead. With that, we started to work with DPS, Durham Public Schools Foundation to get meals to the families. And I'll talk about that a little more. This is just my introduction. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, thank you, Carlene. Um, we're gonna hear from Kate now, and she's gonna talk about a countywide plan that has really brought all this work together. Thank you so much, Lisa. Happy to be here today. I'm Kate Elander. I work for Durham County as our early childhood coordinator, which is a new position for Durham County. And I'm grateful to work with all of these colleagues, um, including Carlene at the county. Um, since January of 2020, right before the pandemic, um, stakeholders in Durham have been engaged in a planning process to develop a local Durham County Early Childhood Action Plan. Um, and Durham County was inspired by the state's work to create a North Carolina Early Childhood Action Plan. After seeing that plan, local leaders in our community decided that creating a similar plan that was informed by our local Durham Bull City context um, would spark support and funding for more early childhood collaboration in our community. Um, and my work, um, my why uh, for being engaged in this work is, is personal. Um, I'm a mom of a four-year-old and an aunt uh, to three kids under five. Um, and the experience of becoming a mother and a parent and an aunt um, have made the importance of investment and in action to create warm and affirming supportive starts for young children and their families is very clear to me. Um, and I've been grateful to be able to work in the early childhood field while also just living it myself. Um, so I'll share a video now um, that explains more about why and how we're creating this action plan. Um, and we'll also hear from a parent and community leader um, about his why for being involved in, in this work to create the plan. Um, and we've just had powerful parent leadership um, shape this plan, and I'll talk more about that uh, soon. So Samara, you can start the video. Thank you. Each and every child up and down is precious and deserves to get the very start in life. No one knows this better than parents. Family members and community raising our little ones. We all want Durham to be warm, edible, just and safe community for everyone, especially for our children. There are more than 35,000 children birthed through the ages of eight in Durham, and we want the city and county we love to be the best place to grow up in. You are the experts working every day to nurture Durham's future. Your voice and experiences are so important. And we invite you to join us shaping and implementing Durham's early childhood action plan. So, what is early childhood action plan or ECAP? 
North Carolina created a plan to ensure young children throughout the state are healthy, safe, and nurtured, and learning and ready to succeed. Durham is going to be the first county in the state to develop our own early childhood action plan to say how we will meet these 12 important goals. The Durham Children Initiative and Durham County have funded and facilitated the planning so far. Parents, community members, early childhood providers like doctors and teachers, as well as leaders from nonprofit and government have joined forces. Over 1,000 people who care for young children have made their voices heard so far. Together, they have developed 21 recommendations and have proposed strategies to bring those recommendations to life. The work is far from over. We want to hear from you. We can't work towards a more safe and just down for all young children and their families without the voice and leadership of people caring for and working with children every day. You know best the complexities of Durham's early childhood system from navigating it yourself. You know the parts of Durham that make it home and the parts that lead to change for Durham to be bright for all children. We hope you join us in shaping strategies, developing the plan, seeing this through for our community and all our young children. Follow this link to learn more. I, I really salute um, Durham for even you know, considering such space for the community uh, to have a seat at the table that we normally don't have a seat at. You know, ECAP is, is, is very important. I hope we continue uh, creating space such as this and um, not just hearing our thoughts, that, but putting, you know, action to our thoughts and our feelings. Um, thanks for, for listening to Randy and um, for uh, tuning in to the video. We're just um, grateful to be working with um, just such an incredible group of people to develop this plan for our community in Durham um, and can share a little bit more later um, about some of the ways that uh, parents have been engaged in leading this work. Thanks. So Kate, I think it would be great for you to just really carry on from here to talk about um, more detail around how parents have been engaged in creating the plan and the, starting the implementation as well. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I think it's important to note that parents did not initially drive the work to create this plan. Um, the decision to create the plan for Durham was made in a little bit more of a top-down way. Um, but since the planning process has began, uh, ha began um, based on feedback from community and also some of the values that were held by members of the planning team, um, we've been able to evolve the process to do a better job, not a perfect job, of centering parent voices um, and making space for leadership. Um, I can talk a little bit about some of the shifts we've made, and I'm sure some of these shifts will sound familiar to those of you who are listening. Um, it's definitely kind of in the water, um, and, and we're all learning along the way. Um, we made a shift from an initial effort to gather parent feedback and perspectives through an online survey um, to shifting to more targeted focus groups to hear from communities that were underrepresented in the survey and to have those focus groups and interviews be led by trusted community members. We made a shift from lifting up population level data, which we can all agree is really important, um, but doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, to lifting up direct um, quotes and perspectives from parents about their experiences um, in their own words with early childhood services and systems in Durham. We also shifted from large work groups meeting during the day with a few parent members of each work group to smaller action teams with more balanced participation between kind of nonprofits and institutional leaders and parents and community leaders. And those groups met at times that worked for those small groups and in languages that worked for those small groups. Um, and then finally, we made a shift from sort of like a governing body that was made up of primarily institutional leaders to a more representative decision-making group with at least half of those members being parents and community-rooted leaders. And now we're making another shift 
um, to plan for an even more representative steering committee where a majority of those folks will be community rooted leaders, parents, um, and kind of frontline workers, folks who are, who are working on the ground in our early childhood space to oversee the implementation of the plan. Um, and I think just a couple more things that it's important to note, we have ensured that parents and community rooted leaders were compensated for their time from the beginning. So that wasn't a shift for us, but we have um, increased that compensation rate because we realized um, that it, you know, it's, yeah, folks are not being paid for their time when they're not associated with a nonprofit or an institution um, who has created space for that type of participation. Um, and we really value their time um, and leadership. And then I guess I'll just wrap up by saying um, there are 21 recommendations in the plan currently. Um, the plan is gonna be released in September. Um, and in most cases, parents and community rooted leaders have co-created those recommendations and the strategies to implement them. And our plan is absolutely stronger for it. Um, so I'll leave it there for now, um, but have, have more to share about more lessons learned a little later. That's great. Thank you. Um, just one question I have. How long has it taken to get to where you are today from when it was first an idea that we were going to create this plan? Yes, um, thank you for that question. We, the um, contract to facilitate the planning process was established in January, 2020, um, as the pandemic was sort of heating up. Um, and so we um, really sort of got underway with an engaged planning process in July or August of 2020. So it's been about a year of kind of deep um, engagement and planning, but 18 months kind of from the beginning um, of when the, when the contract was established to develop the plan. That's great because sometimes people um, sort of can't deal with how long it might take to widen <laughs> engagement and create leadership amongst um, parents and caregivers and guardians. So that's awesome. Um, I think you should be, can be done. <laughs> yes, yes, it can. So I was going to ask Carlene next, when you and I spoke, Carlene, you did mention how some of the surveying, there were things that were coming out of that that really helped you decide what the response um, should be in terms of uh, working with parents around uh, literacy during COVID. And I thought you could speak to that a bit. Yes, thank you. One thing that stood out to me is that parents were asking for free and or no cost, we'll say no cost, no cost programs. Parents were also asking about safe spaces, safe places where families could gather and just be a part of programming or other events. And for us, the library, does serve that purpose. The library does serve that purpose. In our response as a unit, as a unit, the family literacy unit, we wanted to be sure that we could at least continue to provide some sort of no cost programming. And a part of that really included the meals, the, the meals that we worked with. Parents were facing, like I said earlier, these new challenges. And a part of that was really about food insecurity. In fact, I think I mentioned maybe to you or somebody else how COVID-19 really not just highlighted food insecurity, but it also heightened that situation. And so we wanted to be sure that we could be a place where families could have free meals, we are doing that now in our summer programming. We are participating with Durham Public Schools Nutrition Program where we are a feeding site where families can come with their children for a free lunch. Of course, some of the families do have their children in summer school, but those who are not in summer school, they have the opportunity to come to us to participate in our current lunch program. But I wanna go back to last year because last year again was when COVID hit 
and all these issues just kind of rose to the top. When I found out that food needed to be taken to families, I got my team involved and we started to deliver these meals. Again, making sure that that free meal was being delivered to different families. The thing I liked about last year is that Book Harvest reached out about just adding books to that delivery. And of course, that was to me a natural fit, yes. So in addition to delivering those meals to families and other sites, we delivered free books from Book Harvest. So there again, we were responding to that need for free or low cost services. Oops, thank you, Carlene. Um, Caitlin, since Carlene spoke about um, your cooperation together, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how um, the Family Voice has really driven the work, um, especially during COVID, but not exclusively. Sure, yeah. Um, so last summer we began um, a separate initiative from our book boxes called Grab and Go. Um, and this kind of goes along with what Carlene mentioned um, as a way for us to safely share books with families in the community. Um, and so this was a, a curbside service at our office where families could come and get um, age appropriate bags of books for their kids. And that's really when we started um, sharing surveys with families to collect this information about, um, you know, during this time, uh, where should we be with our books um, to make sure that families everywhere have that access. Um, and so from that point on, we've been collecting, we've created this kind of consistent feedback loop from parents and families in our community. Um, and we have heard, um, you know, bus stations, um, parks and community centers, um, schools, churches, um, child care centers. Um, so we've gotten a lot, uh, we've been able to really curate this great list of places, um, some kind of broad like that, but even down to very specific spots about where we should be. Um, and then when this idea of this concept of outdoor book provision was born and we worked with parents to kind of come up with, um, you know, what would this be? Um, the next step was uh, using that feedback and those survey results to start identifying some locations to work with. Um, and so now today we have um, a book box at the downtown Durham bus station. We have one with a child development center here in Durham. Um, we have two with uh, Durham Parks and Recreation at two different community centers. Um, and then later this week, we're going to be installing one at a church, which is our first, um, our first church that we'll be working with, um, with this particular initiative. So um, there's been a lot of um, collaboration with parents um, to, to make sure that we're uh, partnering with uh, locations and organizations that um, they're already going to um, and that they feel safe going to and that these are places where having books outdoors and accessible at any point um, would be helpful and useful to them. Um, and so there's there's been lots of awesome collaboration happening since uh, the pandemic started last year. Thank you. As you said, meeting parents where they are. Um, Katie, would you like to wrap up this, this question for us about, about parents? Yeah, absolutely. And just want to say it's helpful to hear about this parent voice at different levels of all these systems and programs. And I think, yeah, just very thankful to work with all of these folks. And I think on this, on the initiative Capture Moments in Time, the folks on this um, call have been instrumental in it. Um, but the kind of like the guiding initial why of this program was because of a parent having this idea of wanting to emphasize the importance of storytelling, of passing down stories to future generations and having families shape those narratives using their lived experiences. Um, and it happened that another parent who's been really involved um, has also self-published a book and aims at creating books that represent children of color because of disparities in representation. And she talks about the importance of having access to stories that are relatable, increasing children's awareness of diversity, acceptance um, of diversity and just awareness. And so this whole um, initiative is really striving to align with those ideas, the parent desire to have this um, 
And so in addition to having that idea of being birthed from the parents, just the entire process kind of like, as Kate was mentioning, of making sure they are paid for their time, having check-ins that work for them, um, figuring out that they are able to plug in, whether it's a Zoom call, a text message, or actually physically being at distribution sites. So throughout this whole process, um, it's been really wonderful to be partners with them, to learn about them and to see how, like we've talked about today, just different areas of collaboration to make progress and have these kits get out into the Durham community. Can we have a, um, a self-publishing series? <laughs> I really like, I love self-publishing of books. Um, so Katie, why don't we keep going with you? Um, tell us about some of the lessons learned from this work and how does that sort of uh, guide your future work? I think um, one big lesson is how kind of all this work that we've done is it's a process and it's very built on relationships. And so kind of thinking that um, everything will work out perfectly from the beginning is a kind of over, um, is not exactly how to approach it. And I think what I've learned throughout it is being able to develop relationships with these parents that we've been working with, um, understanding the different skills that they've brought to the table, what, um, who they are as parents, their kids, their family members um, has been really wonderful. And I think still having um, understanding that things will change. I know at one of the distribution events we had, some parents come um, and then they came back 15 minutes later with some friends who hadn't heard about it through, I guess, the normal ways of social media and email. So just having that flexibility of knowing things will change. People want to join in on the work that you were doing in various ways. Um, so I think those are the big two big things we've learned. And as we like move from here, figuring out what it looks like to be able to share these stories um, more countywide and to, to see what families have made is the process that we're in right now. So looking forward, looking forward to all that is to come with, with these partners and parents as well. Thank you. Um, Kate, I'm gonna have you sort of build off of that because Katie said something that you mentioned before, your starting point really in the end wasn't your starting point, you know, making those adjustments. Thank you. Yes, I think this, the work over the past year has been full um, of lessons. So it's nice to have an opportunity like this to reflect on what those lessons are and to kind of distill them a little bit. Um, the planning team and many of the stakeholders who um, are involved in this work believe that people who are closest to the challenges should be decision makers and how to address those challenges. Um, and I think that's a value that many of us hold, but being able to translate that value into action and ways of working uh, is challenging. And we have not gotten it right every time. Um, and we're super grateful to the parents and community rooted leaders who helped us um, know when, when we haven't gotten it right and who've pushed us to do better. Um, I think one just um, small lesson learned, um, just to say it's been kind of a, a good surprise, to be honest, um, that the pandemic and virtual meetings have meant that actually more parents and community members were able to participate in the process than I think would have been able to if it were all happening at in-person meetings. Virtual Planning makes relationship and trust building difficult, but it does um, improve accessibility. And so I think we that was ultimately a good surprise for us and very grateful. And I think something we will take into the future. Um, a big lesson um, that we learned is that um, there is discomfort in shifting power. Um, and I think um, for us, shifting power has meant shifting some power away from people with deep expertise and experience in the field of early childhood and toward parents and community members with lived experience and expertise as they are navigating these systems in real time. Um, and I think 
through, as we have been working to shift power, which we are still doing and not done doing, um, I think we have wanted to continue respecting the wisdom and work of more traditional early childhood leaders in our community. Um, and recognizing that a lot of the successes um, that they have, uh, have been hard fought um, in this field that has been undervalued and disrespected in many ways. Um, and we want to be clear about the importance of working differently and shifting influence and power to people closer to those problems or that are experiencing them directly. And it's been hard and uncomfortable at times to do that. It's been a tricky kind of um, uh, road to walk um, and that's okay. I think um, we've been grateful for everyone's patience and willingness to learn with us um, about how to live into that shared value that we have. Um, and then I think the, the last thing I'll say um, about lessons learned is just that um, as we have worked to center parent voices and expertise, uh, root cause issues have been lifted up instead of being pushed to the side. I think oftentimes in early childhood related planning processes, um, it will be said that like, we're not gonna solve poverty and racism with this work that's out of our control. We need to kind of focus on what we can impact. Um, and I completely understand how, why that gets said because it's overwhelming to consider how do you address these big problems. Um, but I think unfortunately when that is said, those issues don't get incorporated into the planning process and we continue to have the disparities and outcomes that we continue to have. Um, so I think our plan more directly addresses those root causes and is like a little broader um, than we thought it would be um, for that reason. And I'm excited about it um, for that reason. And I'm looking forward to the work ahead, um, feeling inspired by the work to directly name things like poverty and racism and, and the, the influence that those have in our early childhood system. So um, yeah, I think those are, those are the um, primary lessons I would lift up this time. There will be more. I have one more uh, quick follow-up for you. And that was earlier you had mentioned that the action plans organize themselves um, with the preferred language um, of the group. So A, how did you reach parents who um, their primary language wasn't English? And did those groups tend to end up being sort of language driven in terms of their, how they were organized? Yes, um, thank you for that question. We, um, simultaneous interpretation and consecutive interpretation for us via Zoom was just really challenging, I think. Um, People who were bilingual and people who just speak Spanish um, did not have the greatest experience um, with planning early on because of those challenges that we had. And so one of the reasons why we broke up the second phase of planning into smaller teams was so that we could have just spent teams that did their planning completely in Spanish. Um, and we ended up having two or three, I can't remember if it was two or three, um, teams that were planning just in Spanish. I think it might have been three. Um, and so the, the folks who were on that team either were um, spoke Spanish and some other language other than English or were bilingual English and Spanish. Um, so I think we there were some folks who just spoke Spanish who were engaged in the beginning. Um, but again, they weren't having that good of an experience with the way that planning was happening. Um, and so it, the decision was partially born out of a recognition that it just really wasn't working very well. And I know there are ways that it does work well and uh, interpretation over Zoom is a major skill. Um, anyway, so yes, I think we, we were able to link up folks who were interested in working on a particular recommendation who also had Spanish language skills and were able to assemble the teams in that way. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Carlene, I thought we'd turn to you to uh, tell us a little bit about some lessons that you've learned during COVID um, and moving forward, what that looks like with the library. Yes, thank you for that question. One key thing for us is that the lesson around flexibility. 
we have to be flexible. Also, there's a lesson around collaborations and partnerships. Those are critical as we support our parents, as we continue to support our parents. Again, with, with the COVID-19, our parents were facing new challenges. And we could have just said, ah, oh, no, we're just gonna wait for things to open up. But I was so thankful that my team really embraced this, this vision, this idea of pivoting and totally changing <laughs> our normal model, our normal service model to, to use our vehicles for meals instead and, and, and books that weren't library books. Normally we are taking library books. So again, just it's just critical to be flexible and, and to really work with our community partners and, and just to collaborate in order to support families. And as we move forward, that's something we wanna keep in mind that things are going to happen. Things will happen, but we need to be ready. We need to be able to to change and just to adjust as needed so that our families can continue to receive vital services. Even, I, even the idea of working with Book Harvest to get books while we're doing meals, that could have been complicated, but because of the flexibility of my team, we made it work. We made it work for our families. Again, just really, trying to make sure that our families are supported in, in, in whatever situation we're in, in our community. And I, I wanna share because I, I just wanna share some comments from my team, because even though they are staff members, some of them are parents, some of them are parents. And I wanna share some comments from my staff. And, one, one staff member says, my experience delivering food has allowed me to be of service to a community in great need at this unprecedented time. The experience has been very rewarding and gratifying and has definitely alerted, I'm sorry, not alerted, altered my perspective on life. Another staff member says, the program has been well organized, which has made the experience a positive one for me. The people receiving the food are very thankful. They shout thank you to us as, and they wave as we're leaving their homes. And again, understand that we were delivering at, at doors. We, th there was no contact. So we weren't able to truly engage our families, but we could feel and sense their thankfulness as we left food and books at their doors. And another person says, I'm really excited and thankful to play a part in helping to get food out in the community. I really think this is something that was and is needed. And another person says, I was so glad to be part of this DP, Durham Public School food delivery. The smiles and the thank yous made my day. <laughs> and again, just, yes, just being flexible. We have to be flexible. To, to reach our community. Thank you. Thank you for that, Carlene. Sometimes public institutions have a hard time being flexible. So that's, that's really important for people to hear. So we're gonna close this section out with Caitlin. Tell us about those lessons that you've learned in, your, in the work of Book Harvest in the past year. Yeah, um, I think, I mean, there are definitely um, a few things that we've learned along the way. Um, I think a big one is uh, just like the logistics of making this happen. There's a lot of moving parts involved um, beyond just like working on what are we gonna call these? How are we gonna get them built and establishing these partnerships? Um, actually doing the installation, there's lots of moving parts. We have to check a lot of boxes before we can break ground and um, put these into place. And then after the fact, you know, there's ongoing maintenance that we have to do on the book boxes um, to make sure that they're stable um, and that they're safe. Uh, so there's lots of logistics with it. Um, so we've learned a lot along the way. 
um, with all of those moving parts. And then something across the board that we're always working on um, and striving for improvement is just ensuring that all of our books are of high quality and high interest and that they're culturally inclusive and representative of our community and all of its members. Um, so we're really working hard to make sure that our book boxes include the best of the best when it comes to our books. Um, so that is another thing. Um, but with one of our partners, we installed a book box at White Rock uh, Child Development Center back in April. Um, and it was really great to work with them. Um, it was great when we did the installation. One of, one of the pictures showed an ins the installation at White Rock. We did a ribbon cutting and the kids were able to come out. Um, and it was really celebratory. We got to watch them. That was kind of our first um, our first time watching kids choose their own books again. Um, we haven't really been able to incorporate that element of choice um, since COVID began. Uh, so that was really our first, our first chance at that. Um, and so because that relationship was so strong, um, the, uh, the director at the uh, center was able to share some surveys with parents. Um, and so we were able to start collecting feedback pretty much right as it was installed from the very beginning to start thinking about what can we be doing better? Um, and then just what are their comments? What are their responses? Um, and so from that pool, we were able to learn that 90% of parents found that the book boxes were useful in establishing a regular reading routine within their families, um, which is the best news you can get. Um, it's, it's really um, validating to hear that it's, it's working and that people are enjoying it. Um, and one parent even went on to say that they thought it was an excellent way for their family to bond and for um, families to kind of strengthen this culture of reading within their children. Um, and so that has inspired and encouraged us to continue thinking about ways to create this continuous feedback loop. Um, so I think in the future, we're gonna think about ways of maybe putting a QR code on the outside of the boxes for parents to scan and let us know what they think um, so that we can continuously be hearing about what could be better um, and what we're doing well. So um, I'm looking forward to getting those into place too. Um, to continue hearing from, from folks in the community. That's great, thank you. Now everybody knows how to use QR codes because you have to use them for menus. <laughs> and if you go to the Durham Bulls game, you can no longer use cash and you have to use the QR code. <laughs> anyway, that's just something I was thinking about. So um, thank you all very much. I want to see if we have questions. I wanna remind people that Mary has put uh, a lot of the documentation that folks have talked about today in the chat, the self book publishing, um, where you can read more about the book harvest program, um, and also the, um, the action plan, a link to the action plan, which um, is chock full of goodies. Um, so thank you all for that. Um, just a little reflection on my part. Um, I think that one thing that we've seen today is how when you do have that countywide action plan, that it really can drive your focus, the cooperation, innovation amongst groups. Um, I don't know what the relationship of the past had been with the, um, ex, um, the extension service, um, but to me, that's exciting to see that um, the engagement um, in that um, area. So I, I think a plan, we all know plans <laughs> are good, but in this case, um, the plan had flexibility. The lessons learned are really being taken seriously and adjustments are being made. Um, and so that's, um, to me, that that's what it's all about um, in order to uh, create the best uh, plan and the best program and, and that you can. So um, any last minute thoughts before we sort of end today? Can I share one more thing, Lisa, on that point? Um, I think we, I mentioned earlier that we were um, intentional from the beginning to ensure that there was compensation built in for folks who were not participating in the planning on behalf of a um, um, kind of larger institution or nonprofit. Um, but I think another thing that um, we didn't do um, was think about how much time this type of planning takes, particularly if you're gonna do it in a way that engages a broader set of stakeholders um, and that is responsive to that feedback and leadership from parents and community and shifts the process along the way, maybe to have nighttime meetings instead of daytime meetings. And um, 
it, that ends up having more iterations um, as we're evolving the process. I think it has been a huge investment of time from the nonprofit and institutional partners that have participated in the process without so far, um, you know, compensation for their time. And I think, you know, nonprofits and institutions understand that there's some amount of collaboration and planning that it kind of comes with the territory, but I think this is a little bit above and beyond that. And I think we're trying to think about how to um, ensure uh, that we're um, also showing with our actions that we are valuing the time of those institutions and nonprofits who participate in the process too. So um, anyway, yeah, just That's another right. lesson um, about, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's why I asked that question, because honestly, I, I was impressed by it. a year is pretty great, considering what you've done and the engagement and the responsiveness to the community. So um, don't be anxious about that. But anyway, I want to thank everyone uh, today again as part of uh, celebrating grade level reading week. We do have one final thing. I've just asked everyone for one word about how they're feeling today, um, the panelists. So let's just go around Robin. I got Caitlin, Katie, Carlene, and then Kate. Sure, um, I think that I'm feeling proud. Um, I feel really proud to be in this community, um, to work with the partners on this screen. Um, I think that there's a lot of good work happening in Durham. Um, I know there's lots of work to be done, um, but I'm just really proud. Um, to, to be at this place. And I take a lot of pride in, in calling Durham home. Thank you. Katie, one word. Grateful and fueled to continue this and to continue all this work, all, all the levels. Sorry, more than two, more than one. <laughs> Carly. Motivated. Awesome. Kate. Um, I'm going to echo gratitude and I'll share, um, uh, happy, um, to be, to be doing this work with all of you and, um, with our broader community in Durham. And then I think you were going to close for us, Kate. <laughs> A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Just kidding. We said we might close with a song, but I, I won't. I won't do that to all of you. Save it. Save it for bedtime with my set. Okay. Well, I'm sorry if I missed that. That wasn't a real thing when we talked. But thank you all again for coming today. Um, please let us know if you want to reach out to any of the um, the panelists today. So um, carry on with grade level reading week. Take care, everyone. <laughs>